Welcome, everybody. This is uh, a very, very special interview. I'm Scott Patton, the Dean of Blogonomics and Pedology, and uh, part of Power Podcasters, changing the way, the way the world communicates. And we are in beautiful Medellin, Colombia, having a great time. And I ran into and became good friends with David Morris, sitting right beside me. Welcome yeah. to the show, David. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. And so, David, how long have you been traveling the world? I've been traveling the world for just under six years now. Six years. Wow. So, let us know some of the countries that you've been in the last six years. Well, kind of the quick overview of the trip. I started from the USA riding north to Alaska on a motorcycle, continued south riding all the way to Argentina, and that was over the course of two years. Wow. Then I flew with my bike to Europe and Romania, because, you know, obvious place to start Europe. Yeah, is if Romania. you're going to go to Europe, you have to go to Romania. Of course. And I rode across Europe from Romania to Spain, Spain to Ireland. Then from Ireland, I arrived in winter, and I was tired of being cold and wet and sick all the time. Right. So I put the bike into storage and flew to um, down in Turkey to warm up. I started backpacking through East Europe. Uh, got up to Poland. It was winter again. Right. So I was tired of being cold where, there. Where is the line between winter and perpetual summer in Europe? I'm kind of curious. Um, uh, Europe really always has a winter as far as I can tell. Okay. But my own personal view on when it's summer versus winter is, do I have a point at night where I'm saying, fuck, I'm cold? Right. <laughs> and that's the time for me to skedaddle somewhere warmer. I see. Okay. Um, so I was at that point in Poland, and I fly to Egypt and then Southeast Asia. Okay, so you went down to Egypt, saw the pyramids. Mm -hmm. Did you get any further south? Oh yeah, I got all the way south in Egypt. I went down the Nile to Aswan, Aswan? Uh, okay. all the way south near the Syrian border. And near the Sudan? Sudan border. Sudan right, border. Right, sorry, Sudan okay. border. Um, and then back so north to Luxor. To Luxor, okay, Luxor was the one I was trying to remember. So how, what did you think of Luxor? You know, all of Egypt is amazing. Okay. Uh, it's uh, from one end to the other. Um, Spectacular. Yeah. So go see it. Yeah. Go see it, everybody. Yeah. Egypt. Some of the most interesting ruins that I've ever seen anywhere okay. in Egypt. So from Egypt, you went to Southeast Asia? Yep. Okay, so now I have to ask, mm -hmm. why not Israel or Jordan, Petra, for example, or that area? Just, just It was basically a whim of the moment. Okay. My um, laptop had died, and I... You know, I can't get by without my computer because I do right. a lot of photography, a lot of communicating with people. And Egypt, I just couldn't get a repair because service centers are too bad. Mm. I saw a good center service center in Malaysia, a cheap <laughs> flight to Malaysia, and a good friend in Thailand. I see. Or sorry, he was in Malaysia at the time. Okay. And so I thought, yeah, why not? I'll just have it go repair to Malaysia. Computer repair on the uh, world trip. You just, well... That, it was really 5,000 miles away, no problem, and away you went. So yeah. you went to Malaysia, went around Southeast yeah. Asia. Yeah. Did you go down to Australia? No. Okay. I traveled around Southeast Asia for several months. So that would be Thailand, Singapore, um, Malaysia, well, Indonesia. For me, it was really just Malaysia, Thailand, and Laos. I was already starting okay. to travel pretty slow at that okay. point. So um, you're, not, you're not one of these travelers that uh, uh, gets like the rail pass, the Euro pass, and goes to 35 countries <laughs> and 48 cities in three days. No. No. Well, I started off traveling pretty fast on my motorbike. Right. But yeah, now you I traveled down. slower and slower and slower over time. Okay. So now when you go someplace or you decide to go someplace, how long would you, like if you, obviously you don't know and you have the freedom and the mobility to, to pick up and go whenever you want. So if you go someplace, you don't like it, see you later, totally understand that. Absolutely. But in your mind, kind of at the back of your mind, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to, like you're in Medellin now, I'm going to come to Medellin, I'm going to be here a week, uh, five weeks, ten weeks, uh, six months. You know, normally I have no consideration at all for that. Okay. Just whatever happens, happens. Okay. Um, right now here in Medellin, I'm trying something very different. I'm you know, The drawback to six years of travel is that I'm constantly moving, and so I've friends scattered to literally every corner of the world. For sure. Um, I have no close friends I've known for years. I can just call up and say, hey, I'm having a bad day. Let's go have a beer. <laughs> um, it's uh, The closest person I know who I could do that with, I think, is maybe 
in the USA at the moment. That would be the closest. Right. Uh, that's about 20 hour flight away. Right. Um, so the it's a drawback to travel. And mm -hmm. so what I'm trying to do here is stay for several months to really get into the society, make good friends, and find a little bit more of that community mm. that is I can just relax into, hang out with, get a real deeper feel for what it's like and those closer friendship ties, closer romantic ties. Right, right. Yes, we, yeah. well that's right. If you're if you're a month, let's just say a month in a city and then you're gone, it's pretty hard to have a, a strong intimate relationship. Absolutely, and even harder when you're a few days or a week. I mean, it's, right. it's kind of cool because you can get super intense relationships because you know, you both know that you're going to leave. Right, so that compresses. Especially if you're both travelers. Oh, okay, yeah. sure. So you can just throw all limitations to the wind and just find out how deep it gets, how fast. But then you're gone and poof, it disappears. Right. And so travel can really be just horrendous on any sort of lasting relationship. Right. Well, long distance relationships are very difficult. Yeah, and I, even though I'm a software engineer by trade and master at the internet, I really don't like internet communication. Mm. So I really prefer things like this, talking to you here right in person, right. right and you look in your eyes. Right. <laughs> well, and that's really what intimacy is about, being able to look the person into the yeah. in their eyes, feel them and and really connect on a lot of different levels, right? I really yeah. believe energetically. Um, and you're right, like I had a friend who got married. Not unusual, right? But I was in Vancouver on the west coast of Canada and he was in Winnipeg. So he says, Scott, I want you to come and you and three or four other guys are going to be my best man. We're going to have this really low-key wedding in the, in the, I was going to say basement, in the backyard. And uh, I said, great. So I said, well, do you have someone that can be my date? And there was this woman that he just loved, but he's getting married to another woman who he loved more, I guess. And he introduced, he said, well, I'll introduce you to her and then you can take her, you know, she can be on your, you know, you can, she's, she's invited, so you might as well come together, right? And yeah. I know you'll like each other and blah, 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 blah. And he was right, we did like each other. And I remember we were sitting at this table with about 600 people and we started to have this conversation. And, and it was unusual for me I think, well, it was unusual because I was aware of what was going on. It might not have been unusual at all, except I was aware. That was the unusual part. And it was like this bubble came over us. All the sounds from everywhere else slowly yeah. dimmed down, right? It, almost like the lights went down and a candle mm -hmm. came up. And, and there was just this warmth. Yeah, and of course, brilliant. yeah. And the worst part of it was there was a guy across the table who had a terrible relationship with his wife, was there by himself, and he could feel it. And so he was mm -hmm. constant, like it was like, it was like a bubble and he was poking at the bubble until finally he burst and he had our attention. Because yeah. I'm sure he had talked a long time before yeah. he actually, we yeah. recognized it, right? Yeah. And, I really love creating those little bubbles. Yes. It's one of my favorite things to do. And you can't make a bubble with an email. No. And, and even it Skype, doesn't it doesn't work. You nearly need to be, close it can work on skype but it's a big challenge mm. it really takes knowing somebody ahead of time and having that in-person intimacy first right and then you can start building it by email skype phone but even then it's, yeah it's, it's really hard. hard well as human beings i think we really someone said you need three hugs a day and I think minimum that's true right and it's really hard to hug your computer <laughs> even if the other person's it face is it's is just not satisfying <laughs> no that's right <laughs> okay so we're in Southeast Asia yeah and yes. we're, we you at in our story we're in Southeast Asia we are now in Colombia so how did you get from there to here now here's where it starts getting complicated because about then is when I realized that this is becoming a permanent thing for me. So I'm not mm -hmm. just traveling around the world anymore. I'm you know, just living in the world is my life. Right. And so I start following my whims of what I want to do next. Mm. So I'm in Thailand. I'm missing tango dancing. I think, oh. you know what? Why don't I just fly to Buenos Aires? Right. You know, it's halfway around the world, but why not? It's a small world. Yes. So I 
hop in an airplane, which was an adventure all itself, that particular trip, and end up in Argentina. Didn't work quite as I expected. I end up getting plantar fasciitis and couldn't oh, really walk easily, definitely no. couldn't dance really. Right. So I don't do a whole lot of dancing, some which was lovely, but I end up traveling around South America again with a backpack. I get up to Bolivia, I break a bone in my foot, Ouch. and yeah, it's interesting, quite an adventure. It's a lot of good tales around that one too. Right. But so I'm healing up in Sucre in Bolivia, and my mom invites me to go visit her while I'm healing up, uh, go in the USA where I'm from. And now, is this the first time you've been back since you left for um, this trip? That would have been the second time, okay. but the first extended stay. Okay. Yeah. So you're not exiled from the United States. Yeah. It's just you're traveling the world and Yeah, and I really didn't want to go back at that particular point, okay. but I hadn't seen family for any extended period at that point, and I wanted to reconnect with them. And, you know, I can't really do much anyway, so I figured, sure. oh, this is not? a good time. It's a good time for it. So I do that, and it's spending quite a bit of time in the USA reconnecting with uh, family, friends, but then that hardware in my foot from the breaking the bone, I actually had a spiral fracture, so it broke like this, Ooh. and I had to have screws put in to hold it together. And that hardware was just a constant source of drain on me, pain, couldn't do much. Sure. So I fly to Thailand to get the hardware removed. And I figured, you know, <laughs> why not? Save a bundle of money, I can get a massage every day while I heal, All I can right. Meditation in the temples and all that good stuff. Yeah, so I I'm there for a while um, Heals up really fast great place to have the surgery done then I fly to Japan random whim okay. uh, From Japan. I was looking to ride the train through Russia, but that didn't work out So on another whim, I just find a cheap flight to Finland Wow, from the, Japan. you're not going like any sort of sequence at all. No. You're just as I said, just totally following my Get a map wings. and then just throw a dart yeah. and there you go. Yeah, cool. and that's kind of how I ended up here because it continues from Finland. I went to Ukraine, then Poland uh, for a conference. Then it was pretty close to throwing a dart. Uh, let's just visit family for briefly in the USA yeah. and then fly to Colombia. Oh, okay. And, and here you are. Yeah. Although it wasn't really thinking I would fly to Colombia. It was basically, um, I think it was 3 a.m., I'm thinking, you know, I'm kind of tired of Poland. It's getting towards winter again. Again. And winter you know, comes up it's, every year, doesn't it? It's so annoying. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> so I like it here that it doesn't really happen. No, so it's I'm, the same all the time. It's yeah, great. Yeah, it's 3 a.m. in Poland. And I think, you know what, let's just go visit family. And about 10 hours later, I'm sitting on the airplane. And I'm there for, I have one month I can be there. And. I'm thinking of where do I want to go, mm -hmm. and why not Colombia? I've been wanting to revisit Colombia, and sure. here I am. And here you are. Cool. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you've noticed as you've traveled, both, uh, I, and I want to kind of touch on in terms of, these are what I, the thing, sort of some of the things that I thought when I was in the American culture, like before I mm -hmm. actually left, right? Because I've noticed, being Canadian, that uh, there are, I don't know if we call them urban myths or uh, beliefs that uh, that everyone around me sort of hold, or or you, the society around me holds. And then when you actually get out, it's like, wow, this is, there there's a different set of beliefs. Like in Medellin, has a different set of beliefs mm -hmm. than Vancouver, Canada, obviously. And you go, oh, this is interesting. This isn't kind of what I thought or what everybody back home yeah. said I would experience, sort of thing. And then also just sort of how you've grown as a person through the yeah. six years. Because it's, I think from, for most people, the idea of, well, I'm in Poland and, you know, I think maybe I should go to Singapore tomorrow. No, no, no. yeah, no, Bangkok, Bangkok, okay. And then you're there, right? Because most yeah. of us kind of have this, well, I would say uh, the majority of people have, an, have a number of anchors, one of which is either a mortgage or a rent yeah. or a car payment where it could be kids too, right? Mm -hmm. Or an elderly There's parent. a lot of anchors and excuses, really. And excuses, right? And of course, the world is a very scary place. We keep, I mean, I keep hearing that about, oh, this happens and that happens. And mm -hmm. um, 
as kind of an aside, when I ever, the first time I was told people I was coming to Medellin, of course, this was the drug capital cartel place of the world 10 or 15 yeah. years ago. And, and you know what? Let me actually stop you here because you've already brought up about 20 hours of conversation that we could go into. <laughs> so right. before you add on another 20 hours, why don't I dive into a couple of these? All right, yes, dive into them. Um, so let's take the really big one first. In, and that you mentioned about Colombia being such a scary, dangerous place. Now, when I stop on my motorcycle, I'm headed south, and of course, there's Mexico in the way. Right, and, and to me, Mexico is a very scary place. Yeah, I mean, I had a cousin, for example, that said, you go to Mexico, you're committing suicide, yeah. and I'm not gonna talk to you again. <laughs> and she hasn't, she's held up to that. Wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, not that I ever really knew her on well, the first place, right. but not even she so, was talking to she's very carefully before. just never talked to me at all since right. then. And I get there, and you know, it's one of the most delightful countries I've been to. I never mm -hmm. felt in fear of my life ever. I never felt as dangerous ever. Um, honestly, some of the most dangerous places I've been are in the USA and West Europe. And right. Those are the places where I felt the most right. danger. Right. Um, and it's interesting what you say about uh, Mexico, because when I fly back to Canada, I'm stopping in Mexico City for 22 hours. Oh, and the person, the person that is here was telling me how dangerous Mexico City is. <laughs> like, and if you listen to him, you would never go. Yeah. Ever. Right? And there is actually some truth in that, because you know, there, it got that reputation for a reason. Mm -hmm. But what people fail to realize, in part at least, is that you know, there's a difference between the city and what you'll see as a tourist. As a tourist, right. you're going to the best parts of the city, the most interesting ones, right. the ones that are set up for tourists, generally. And, and generally not at four in the morning in the yeah, ghetto areas. Exactly. And, but the other thing is, this is one of the other big, hairy conversations that you brought up, is that the world is run by fear. Mm. And the reality of the world it just doesn't line up to that. Yeah, the this is true ever I've been. I hear stories like on my motorbike, it's especially interesting. I'm traveling through, you know, this little city somewhere in Central America, say, and I'm talking about my travel plans, where I've been. They say, wow, you came from that city over there. How did you even survive there? Mm. I'm just glad you're safe now. <laughs> so where are you going next? I start telling about my trip and what's next, and they get this horrified look, and don't go there. It's there. I mean, it's, it's even worse than where you came from. They'll just, <laughs> they'll kill you as soon as look at you. Right. But then I get the next city, that place they're saying is so horrible. And the same conversation, where I just come from, oh, they're horrible thieves. Next place is cutthroat. Right. So it happens again and again and again. So everybody has this bad reputation yeah. of... Uh, everybody. Everybody else. Yeah. That really is not true. Absolutely not. Right. The world really is not a place to fear. Everybody just wants to live a happy life. Yes. There are bad things that happen. happen. Yeah. But it's nothing that we need to be afraid of, generally. Yeah. I would rather go out and enjoy life, enjoy this beautiful city, the interesting people I meet. I don't want to live in fear. No. There's no way to live. And when I stopped living in fear, I realized that, you know what, there's really nothing to fear. It's mostly just propaganda put out by, by the media, by corporations. It makes a lot of money, right. but it's not the reality of the world. The reality of the world is everybody wants to live a happy life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've not met anybody who says anything else. They, right. You talk to them and they say, oh, I, I want to live a happy life. I yeah. want, you want peace. I want peace and happiness and to go out my life and find out what I enjoy. and yeah. Raise my kids. And yeah. It's universal. Nice dinners. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then well, that is an absolute opposite of what uh, the main news outlets are putting out, right? It's yeah. always, you know, so-and-so got shot, this little child has disappeared, all these things. Absolutely. And the world has really changed a lot in the last 60 years. Like, I see all these parents taking their kids to school, and I walk blocks and blocks to school, right? You know, at the same, you know, mm -hmm. in elementary school ages, right? No one ever thought there was, there was never ever any concern, right? 
And of course, okay. the, the neighbors all knew who I was, and everyone sort of looked out. If you had a problem, you knew you could go to some house, and there'd, Mrs. Jones would be there, and she'd give you a cookie, and it would be fine, <laughs> right? If your mom wasn't home for whatever yep. reason, right? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, that's, you remind me of a small village I was in Ecuador, and I love those communities in the small Ecuador villages mm -hmm. because I had this friend who was also traveling on a motorcycle volunteering at the hostel, and one day we went to a market in another city about half an hour right away, and he brought one of the children of the family that was running the hostel, and this kid might have been 10 years old, give or take a couple of years. And so we're off exploring the market. He just runs off and looks around at stuff, says, says hello to some friends. And then he comes back and says, you know, you know what, I'm going to go play with my friend this afternoon. Tell mom that I'll be back for dinner or sometime uh, right. after dinner or something like that. And How old is he? About 10 years old. About 10 years old. Okay. And he just runs off and the whole assumption is that, yeah, that's fine, that's normal. Yeah. And, you know, he's off in another village about 10, <laughs> 20 miles away. And, and you, of course, off. have no idea how to find him if you wanted to find yeah. him. Yeah, you know, it's not my responsibility. <laughs> I'm just a third party observer to this. Right. But I'm just looking at my friend who's been living there for a few months now right. and thinking that, wow, so, how is sorry, this I meant normal? your friend's responsibility. Yeah, right? I mean, how is this normal? But what I realize is that kid, really, the whole community is that kid's parents. That's right. Yeah. And so there was no fear, no danger. It's, you know, responsibility on that kid's shoulder, of course. Sure. But, you know, we really lose sight of the fact that kids can be responsible for themselves. That's right. Yeah, you just give them the responsibility. We take too much responsibility away from them. Yes. In many ways. Yeah, from everybody in all our lives we do. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So you've been traveling for six years. You, what sort of attitudes have you noticed that have, in you that have changed? Okay, we've got the one about mm -hmm. the fear. Well, I have to realize that everything about me has changed. Okay. So that's probably a lot bigger question than you realize. Right. I mean, take absolutely any aspect of me. You, you pick. Um, <laughs> well, like, you know, it's everything. I started off as an engineer. I do a little bit of software now, but I really try not to. I, right. I had my old, so, whole life plan at one point. So your whole so, idea of work and money has changed dramatically. Oh, yeah. I mean, so can you I don't care about money. Right. Okay, so you, you gave us one example in terms of you had this career, the software engineering career, and it was all laid out. I can, you, we can all imagine what that was, right? It's the oh, typical 40-year yeah. Standard career. American story. That's right, okay? So you, you traveled, you said, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. You work as a freelance. Uh, so you really have the digital lifestyle, right? Where yeah. you work remotely, you can do your work from wherever it is yeah. that you are, and you understand obviously understand budgeting yeah. and expenses. So you do enough work to, to cover everything. It's ongoing. So yeah. let you, me actually put a totally different twist on things. Sure. Uh, because in, yes, I have this career in software and everybody looks at me and says, you know, of course you can travel because you have money, you're rich, you have this uh, income in software, you can just earn as much as you want whenever you want. That's not how I do it at all. Um, in reality, money doesn't matter in travel. It's a total fiction. It's, I spent quite a bit of time on this trip where I had basically no money. And for a couple of months, my bank account was right around $100 or less. Okay. And uh, I was accepting at that point that, well, I'm basically going to be living borderline poverty the rest of my life. I'm still going to travel the world and enjoy right. it. And that's one of the biggest things that trips people up. Because, you know, in spite of being a software engineer and working now, uh, I, my budget is below poverty level in the USA, typically. Well, sometimes higher, but a lot of times lower. And the world is my playground. Right. And being able to do that, you know, basically we're all being sold a bill of goods. It's just totally being lied to. Well, we see the bill of goods uh, as recently as last Black Friday, in my opinion. Because oh, yeah. you have all these people going out and they are, uh, you know, spending a fortune on things that they don't need with money mm -hmm. that they don't have. And once yeah, you that's kind of, a good part of it. Once you get out of that paradigm, right, 
And it's very, very difficult because what I noticed in Colombia, there's a lot of people that have very little. You know, they live in a very small place mm -hmm. with their children or their family and they don't have a lot of stuff. Although I noticed that there are certain things that they make sure they do have, right? You know, like some of them, they have very nice nails done or their mm -hmm. hair is perfect or they have a beautiful dresses and, you know, but they, they, they live at the poverty level, right? Or way below what would be North American poverty levels. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I notice with them a lot of times, like they'll go to, the, uh, like Medellin and Colombia have as nice a malls as you'll find anywhere. As far as I'm concerned, like you go into these malls, and absolutely, it's like, they are magnificent mm. malls. Yeah. Rivals the best in the USA. Yes, they're very no nice. And, and they go in, and, and these, you know, these friends of mine that I've gone into the malls with them, and it's just like they're just looking and looking and shopping and wanting to, you know, get this and wanting to get all that. And so they've bought into because they have nothing. They've really bought into this materialism that's required, yeah. right? And I think. What you're talking about is like the opposite of that. If you just yeah. let go of you know what you think, what you yeah. want versus what you need. Like I need water, I need air, I need some food. Mm -hmm. I need a. I, would, I don't know about need, but I really like having yeah. a roof over my head and a soft bed, yeah. right, and a toilet that works. Yeah. <laughs> you know, once you kind of got that. I'm a covered, big fan of the toilets, especially. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> particularly if you've been some places like India where I've been, oh. where you squat. I mean, it's just. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so tell us some more of the things that you've noticed as you've traveled and that have impacted you and sort of changed mm -hmm. how you've, like, let's just say the baseline is the typical 40-year mm -hmm. working career plan mm -hmm. with the two and a half kids and the yeah. white picket fence and all those sort of things. So as you've gone through your travel, I'm sure it wasn't a, you know, you went to sleep one night, the next night, um, I'm, I don't want any of these things. I think it was yeah. probably a gradual process. Exactly. And what were some of the uh, some of the other things that really kind of impacted how the process occurred for you? Yeah. Um, well, one of the bigger things that really impacted me is living in hostels for most of the last six years. Okay. So I'm living in dorm rooms. I have zero privacy. I have people running around everywhere. And you have to realize that you know, now, you know, you've met me, I'm a fairly outgoing, extroverted type person. Right. I'm actually a hardcore introvert. All right. Um, and you know, before travel, I was about as far over onto the computer geek side of the scale as you could get, to right. the point I was even living as a hermit, pretty much. Mm, and, okay. And so living in these hostels really made me realize that the internet and these phones that we have, all of it is toxic. What's important is these real person-to-person -person contact, the mm. conversations that we have, sitting down in person, talking to each other. Um, we like to say that the internet has connected all of us together through the whole world, and it's true and it's great, but we're losing sight of the true importance of seeing here, I'm here with you in this moment and you alone. Right. And having that real powerful connection at every level beyond just those text on the screen, at every level of human existence. Right. And it is so important. I, mean, yeah, I totally agree. Nothing more important yeah. out there. It just drives me crazy when I'm with somebody and they're constantly checking their phone and texting mm -hmm. somebody else or texting their Facebook or let me take a picture and post it on Facebook. It's just like, absolutely, dude, let's just like be together and talk for a while, yeah. right? Precisely. And, uh, and I will call people out on that, um, you know, especially when I'm out on a date. I will say something like, you know what, I, I want to actually be here with you, not your phone. I mm -hmm. want you to be in this space that I'm at. Just. Okay, so that was one of those moments when the camera just decided to turn itself off and uh, we're back. So <laughs> we were uh, we were just talking about the addictive quality of our electronics. <laughs> And actually, that's yeah. getting off the topic of the uh, Absolutely. six year plan. That's six not something plan. we need to talk about no, anymore. That's right. So, <laughs> Although you hinted at something very interesting there. That was another huge revelation in my own life with travel. Okay. And that, you know, what I grew up with in the USA is a view of, you know, we need to find equality between men and women. And, mm. you know, there, it's good. You know, it needs to happen. But what I did not realize is that has taken a path of men and women should be the exact same in life. 
But travel has shown me that's just not true. You that know, they should not be the same. Right. There they should can, be equality. Right. But having different ways of life, different perspectives, is actually a really good thing. Mm -hmm. And something that we don't like to admit in Western culture in general is this idea of the masculine and feminine ways of living in the world. Right. And what brought this to mind is that idea of, you know, set down the uh, your devices, your iPad, and actually sit here and be with me. And that concept that I create of that little presence is a masculine way of existence. It's creating this mm. space, the safe space to exist in. And then a woman I am with um, inhabits that space and fills it up. Right. And it's beauty, creativity, creation. Right, the feminine and, energy. Yeah, that feminine energy. And it's totally changed my life accepting that because the more you have that polarity between that masculine, feminine way of life, there's a lot more sparkle and joy added to everything. Right. And it's been totally revolutionary to how I live. Oh, very cool. Yeah, like the, I often think of it as a battery and there's two charges, right? And if the, if, the, if the two charges are together too much and too close, then they just neutralize each other and it's kind of flat. But when you've got the sparks going between the two, yes. then you've got the, the joy of life occurring. Yes. Yes. Now, an important distinction in this, which again, a lot of people lose sight of, is we all have masculine and feminine sides within ourselves. Yes. And it's about embracing both within ourselves. And by embracing both, then we can live that polarity when we choose to, or meet in the middle when it's appropriate. And that's right. there are times when it's good. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about America's place in the world. <laughs> That's a very interesting one, because right. the whole world, of course, looks to the USA. For a lot of things. For a whole lot of things, and you know, it's understandable. We have the strongest military, the strongest economy, um, we developed a whole lot of the new technologies in the world. Been a leader and forever. Been a leader for a long, long time now, and it's only gotten more extreme over the last couple of decades. So it's, you know, it's very understandable that the world looks at the USA, but it's, I have very mixed views on the country. I started off really hating my own country for quite a while on travel, mm. but as I've gone through my own spiritual development and talked to a lot of interesting people, I've come to a lot more accepting view. And, you know, oh, I do, interesting. I, yeah, it's, I see a lot of good things, a lot of possibility. I do have this feeling that USA has passed a peak and has been in a slow decay for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. But it's like there was so much upward momentum. It actually continued up, even though was, uh, the impetus had decayed away. Right. The actual position in the world has continued up for a long time, and we're only just now starting to see the real effects of that decay. But my main difference between a lot of people who hate America and are down on what's going on is that I see a lot of hope that is still possible. Hmm. I see changes happening, I see people uh, wanting to move things in a different direction, and it's not like, you know, the Rome has fallen and might as well just give up. Right. You know, Although the Roman Empire did take a thousand years before uh, it finally... Absolutely. Right. And who knows? It, it could be us too. I don't know. But I also see a possibility of just totally turning things around again. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, good. It's so, not necessarily the end. So your travel has given you a lot of optimism about uh, the United States. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And Now, uh, I'm not living there at the moment, which is kind of telling in its own way. <laughs> and we could debate for a long time on what that means. But right. Well, you've gone, you've gone on an adventure, right? You didn't intend, I'm sh I, my understanding is you didn't intend for it to be six years or ten years or whatever oh, no, it ends up being. No, you know, never imagined just, this. You just sort of... <laughs> took off and and the next thing you know you you just sort of followed the path i liken it to we we're walking on a path through our life right now yeah. and what i've noticed is when i'm not on the path it's like i love being in the woods so it's like when i'm walking on a path in the woods and it's it's a nice path everything's easy and nice mm -hmm. you just walk 
But when you're off the path and you're in the bramble bushes and yeah. the thorn bushes off and bushwhacking. in bushwhacking and you're getting scratched and and there's a, there's you know badgers coming after you and a black bear over there and everything else, then it's like yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. And so my f- sense with you is is that you kind of took the step out of the United States and into the world, and then this uh, the beautiful uh, path opened up before mm-hmm. you, and you're just exploring, yeah. it, right? Totally by accident, but yes. yes. Uh, and it can only happen, I think, totally by accident. Not necessarily only, but well, for the majority of us, hmm. you know, we don't we don't wake up and say. Yeah, I think you're kind of right that what you just said there is the key point: is you have to wake up. And frequently, waking up like that does happen by accident. It doesn't have to, but that is the most common way. Right, because most of us don't re- don't realize we're asleep. Right. Yes. You know, I had a I had a girlfriend once who said, "You're the most awake guy I've ever met." I said, don't say that. I said, I might know that I'm asleep, but that's as far as it goes, yeah, right? That doesn't mean I'm awake. And uh, so you, you, so you, yeah. oh, you know, you, the world really opens up when you open up yeah. to it. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting that bushwhacking analogy that you give to it, because that kind of hints at the way I view my own life for several years now is, you know, I, I used to plan everything out, you know, basically from school until death. Yes. But now what I do is what I like to call it is surfing on the edge of chaos. Mm, so if you actually I go over that. into chaos, then everything kind of falls apart because there's yes. no structure at all. Right. But if you're standing back from the chaos, you're in order. Yeah. You know, yeah. That nice safety margin. Then everything is so predictable and planned and what I know now is it was never quite working for me mm-hmm. and you know it's arguable if what I have is a good balance or not right. but what I do is I'm right at the edge of chaos and so never quite knowing exactly where it's going just finding a direction and taking a leap of faith right. every single moment but never quite all the way into the chaos either I still have that little grip on order right yeah and we it, it, I'm a Libran, so I'm all about balance, right? Like, it, and you, you can't be, you, you can be out of balance and everything else, but if you're not sort of striving to be in the balance and aware of what is balanced for you, then to me, if you, to me, what I understand when you talk about falling in the chaos is when someone's life actually just disintegrates in front of them, right? Yes. Everything falls yeah. apart. They're just a, they're a mental wreck, an emotional wreck, a physical wreck. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, that's happened to me sometimes when I step too far. Yeah. And, that, and that's part of how you learn, right? It's yes. not a failure by any stretch of the imagination. No. No, it's part of the experience and of the no, growth. Part of living a good life. Right. And, uh, yeah. and you know, and you need to sort of step step a bit too well that's a bit too far and and over time you start to learn that balance and as you become a really good surfer then it gets really exciting because i've tried to surf a couple times i've 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 given up on it okay for me i remember my experience (laughs) yeah for me the surfing is you know you get up on this thing a wave comes along you fall off the thing flies in the air and hits you on the head half the time (laughs) right but but you see the people that know how to surf Right, and there's these massive waves coming, and they're skimming through, and they're just going back yeah. and forth, and that's what we want to do with our life, right? Because yeah. it's controlled chaos. Yeah. Because if they make a mistake, that wave crashes on them. Yeah. They're kaput, right? Yeah. I mean, they've broken something for yeah. sure, right? And you know that happens periodically, mm-hmm. like the breaking my bone in Bolivia, bone in my foot. It's thought everything was going well, and all of a sudden, wham! There you go. Just toss to the four winds. <laughs> cool. Well, we've been at least uh, 30 minutes talking, and I think this would probably be a good time to sort of wrap it up. If you had any... Uh, there's a couple things I'd just like to, to have you share uh, sort of as, as kind of closing. One would be kind of the advice to the American people in terms of travel, right? Because... There is such a, particularly since 9-11, particularly since everything mm-hmm. that's happened in the Middle East and the, the you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and everything else, there's a lot, uh, I believe, a lot of fear about going abroad, right? In fact, I was talking to a friend of mine who lives in Philadelphia and about my trip and everything else, and he, he admitted to me, he's over 60, and he says, you know, I'm really scared of the idea of 
leaving the United States. In fact, he said, I went up to Toronto, Canada, and I was really scared. And I said, I, he says, I know, because you're going to tell me, like, there's no safer place for an American to go than Canada, right? Which is true. And he, and he says, yeah, I know it's totally irrational. So I'd like you to kind of address that. And then either a tip or, uh, you know, some words of wisdom just in general about what you, what you would say to, to someone who's maybe about to embark on the 40-year plan, mm -hmm. you know, and how that relates to actually like living a life that's worth living. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I would say to Americans, uh, well, to anybody really, is that, you know, the world really is not on that scary a place. There's lots of fear out there that we're told, you know, fear of this, fear of that, give me just about any subject and right. I can tell you what we're told to fear. Yes. It's not even always obvious. It's these you know, really hidden away little subtle things and like even things like take your vitamins. Mm, the right. implicit statement is take your vitamins or something. you won't be healthy right. and something bad will happen. And, but really, the world is not a scary place. And you know, it's, this is going to sound brutal, but basically, grow up. It's, <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. It's are you going to be the scared little child in the world? Or are you going to grow up, face the world, and walk into it? You, you know, know it's, it's really that simple. You know, it's really funny about what you just said was when you think historically. What made America great was all of these people doing exactly what you just said, mm -hmm. coming to America. Like, you had, absolutely. You know, I mean, it was you were starving, you were you were dying of thirst, your, your crops were failing, and you did you, it anyways. You did it anyway. You're freezing. Yeah. You know, you're. Yeah, and, yeah. Of course, it will feel scary at first, and there's times that you know I'm still terrified at mm -hmm. times. So, so what? Step, step okay. through the fear. Yeah. Yeah. Great Absolutely. advice. I mean, every new country I go to, I feel a little pang of fear. Still, every country. <laughs> I do too. And and the the what I what I uh, how I interpret it is, what am I going to do if that customs officer tells me I can't come in? <laughs> That's the, my biggest fear, right? Like I have a place to stay tonight. I just got to get on the other side yeah. of that fence, and I'm waiting and I'm sweating yeah. and like. I don't, can't speak yeah. Ukrainian or yeah, For Spanish. me, it's that night before I fly or whatever. It's, that's when it happens to me. Yeah. Like, I'm sitting there or restless. It's going to go sleep and oh no. <laughs> yeah. So it's not about no fear. Yeah, it's, it's about being brave and stepping yeah. through the fear. Not even about being brave. It, because you know, we think that being courageous and brave is this big thing that either you have it or you don't. But really, it's just a little step, little step, a little step. Right. That's all it is. I mean, yes. I, what I did did not take any courage. It was just a whole bunch of little steps that accumulated one after another. Right. That's all it was. Beautiful. Yeah. So right. embarking on this career, uh, the thing that I see that everybody misses is you can always change. Mm. Everybody always feels locked into what you're doing. You know, you set up, you go to college, you set this career, you start working, and you think that, okay, I'm stuck here, but we aren't, ever. Right. And we think that our past drives us forward, but that's false. It just shows us where we've been. It's like the wake of a boat. Yes. The wake does not drive the boat. The wake just shows where the boat has been. At any point, that boat can just change directions. And our life is like that. You can just do something totally different. Walk away, right. pick something else up. It'll be fine. Yeah, I really Always. like that. And, and that attitude, I think, is really important. Because if you don't try something, then you don't know if you're going to like it. So, yes. you know, try being an accountant. And then it's like, ah, no, I don't like this. Okay, so I'm going to try being a sales clerk in a grocery store or something. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't like this. Or I'm going to try something else and try something else until you find the sweet spot. And that's a part of the growing process. And you, you will find your sweet spot. It comes, right? Because always. Always comes. You just have to yeah. be patient. And it might not be what you expect either. Well, it I, certainly wasn't for me. 
did I ever think I would be in Medellin with a camera recording you? <laughs> you know, uh, 20 years ago would be the furthest thing from yeah. my mind, right? Yeah, same here. Yeah, so awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time, David. Really appreciate yes. you. Really appreciate your friendship. Thank you, and Scott. And I'm really excited that you're sharing all this with yeah. everybody. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us, everybody. This is Scott Patton for the Impact Magazine, Chief Foreign Correspondent, reporting from Medellin, Colombia.